Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It is my pleasure to introduce Peter Abir. Peter is an associate professor at the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at UC Berkeley. Um, he is super well known for his work on apprenticeship learning for, and more generally for robotics and uh, using uh, reinforcement learning and deep learning. And he has been leading this field. And we are honored to have you here and to learn about how uh, to combine re reinforcement learning and deep learning for robotics. Thank you, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, I actually do believe deep reinforcement learning will result in very significant advances in robotics in the foreseeable future. But let's first take a look at what is reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, an agent is in a state, takes an action, then it lands in a new state, and it gets a reward associated with that new state. And this process repeats over and over and over. And the goal of the agent is to somehow maximize the expected sum of rewards it's accumulating. Now, what are some challenges that are not necessarily present in supervised learning when you do reinforcement learning? First one is stability. So when you change your policy, it will not only change your actions, it will also change the states that you visit as a consequence of the change in actions, and this could destabilize your performance. Another change is credit assignment. Let's consider an example reinforcement learning problem. An agent is supposed to get out of a maze. Maybe you only get a positive reward when you're out of the maze, zero everywhere else. Then, once you're finally out of the maze, the question is, what, what was it that you did that got you out of the maze? You might have done a lot of things that were not relevant. How do you tease out what mattered, what didn't matter? Third one is exploration. You don't get given a bunch of data. You actually have to go explore, find out, are there bigger rewards somewhere than I've seen so far, and figure that out on your own. So when I was asked to talk in uh, this symposium, um, the invitation cited three papers we recently posted on the uh, archive that actually look at three quite different ways of trying to tackle this problem. And there are more different ways to tackle this. Um, but these are the three different ways that we've been looking at in those three papers. One of them is policy optimization. It's one approach. Another one is you can reduce reinforcement learning in some settings to supervised learning. That's the second thing I'll talk about. And then there are pure value function-based methods, which is the third thing I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Let's start with policy optimization. So in policy optimization, the goal is to find a parameter vector theta. This could be all the parameters in a huge neural net, um, such that the mapping from states to actions optimizes expected sum of rewards. Um, one reason you might want to do that, rather than, let's say, exploit the dynamic programming property that you have in the value iteration equations, is that sometimes, or even often, a good policy can be simpler to represent than a good value function. And the other reason is that, actually, when you're developing this and you're trying to get something to work, the beautiful thing about policy optimization is that you actually can measure how well you're doing. You change your parameter vector theta, you can execute according to that new parameter vector theta and see on average how well you do. Is it better or worse than before? And then you can keep the update or go back. So a lot of existing work in that area. Um, I think the big challenge is how to speed up the learning in this problem. So like if you take tiny, 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 tiny steps along the gradient direction, you might ultimately get there, but how do you take larger steps? And so one of the things we start looking at then is how to bring trust regions into policy optimization so we can define how far we can step. And so in the trust region policy optimization paper, which was presented at ICML this summer, um, what we looked at is a trust region of the following type. What you see here is we have some approximation of the objective, gradient times delta parameter vector theta, and then subject to a constraint that the distribution over states being visited under the new parameter vector theta plus delta theta has to be close to the original distribution under parameter vector theta. This allows you to stabilize your policy updates so you don't get that destabilizing effect that I mentioned earlier. It also turns out much easier to pick epsilon than to pick some kind of uh, weighted trade-off between different terms. Now let's take a look at the gradient part. So the typical gradient that you would see in a reinforcement learning algorithm using a reinforced gradient would be grad log pi theta action given state. And so that's saying it points in the direction of the log probability of the action given state multiplied with something. If that something is positive, then you would increase the probability of the action you just took. If it's negative, you would decrease. And so what's multiplied in there is the reward you got after taking that action minus value, which is the average you would have gotten from that state. And so if you're better than average, what probability is goes up. What Go is ahead. P? What is what? P? P. P. Okay, so 
P here is the distribution over trajectories that you would encounter when acting according to a policy with parameter vector theta. So tau is a full trajectory, P is a distribution over trajectories, and so you want to keep the distribution over trajectories close. Thank you. Um, and so what you see here is that you would compare rewards you encountered with what you would get on average, and the problem is that this could be a noisy estimate, because the rewards you got in one execution could be quite different from what you would have gotten in the next execution. So we looked at how to make this less noisy using something called generalized advantage estimation. And the idea here is rather than using the actual rewards you encountered literally as they are sitting there, you estimate something like a Q function, so it's combining method one and three in some sense. And we use a deep neural net to approximate the value function that's sitting there and a particular trust region optimization method to be able to learn a high dimensional value function in a reliable way. Once you do that, um, you're able to get results like this. This is in Mujoko, a simulator developed by Emma Todorov at the University of Washington. And what you see here is a character supposed to make forward progress. And initially it's mostly falling over, um, but over time it figures out the reward is higher when it gets, makes further progress forward, and so it learns over time something like walking or running. Um, but we don't tell that it needs to walk or run, we just give it positive reward for forward progress, negative reward related to how hard it makes contact with the ground. And every iteration here corresponds to a new setting of all the parameters in the neural net, where it then does about 500 seconds of rollouts under the current parameter settings to approximate that gradient, approximate, to approximate the gradient and to compute that trust region. Exact same algorithm, different robot, same reward function. Again, further forward is better, and over time it figures out a setting of the parameters in the neural net that allow it to make fast progress. In fact, for this four-legged robot, it's probably not very realistic what it finds, but it's exploiting what Mujoko allows it to do, and so it learns to go very, very fast. Um, here, the reward is related to the height of the head. So there's nothing there about what it means to get up. It's just the head needs to get to a certain height to get the maximum reward. And over time, it actually figures out pretty proudly um, how to get there. So let me contrast this for a second with what we saw, or some of us saw, in June for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And this is what you got to see with a lot of really good robotics teams um, <laughs> competing over $2 million prize. Um, so this is a hard problem. I'm not saying these are the best performances you would have seen there. But it indicates that there is not, no such thing as, let's just download a locomotion controller and use that. <laughs> Another thing we tried then is to apply this to the Atari games environment. Uh, we were definitely not the first to test things there, but I think what's intriguing is that the approach we developed with locomotion in mind did also perform well, not as well as the other two approaches listed, but pretty well on learning to play Atari games, which is a very different kind of setting where you take pixels as inputs, right, and joint angles and joint velocities. But how about real robot skills? A robot that can really do something. Um, for that problem, we've actually looked at the second type of approach, and actually many of you probably saw Igor Mordach present something along those, along those lines of work in the main conference, and this is reducing things to supervised learning. And the idea here is we still want to find a policy pi theta that maximizes expected sum of rewards, but we're going to do this indirectly. We're going to find auxiliary policies pi i, which are solutions to specific problems that we know we can solve more effectively. And these don't have to be general policies pi i, they're specific to those specific problems. But then we have a constraint or a term in the objective that says our general policy pi theta should be quite similar to these policies pi i. And if that's the case, we're effectively looking at solving the first part to solve very specific problems, find very specific policies, and then supervise learning to match pi theta to each of the pi i's. Things you can do, we're interested in pi theta that goes from pixels to actions. Um, we might say, well, at training time, we're going to simplify it. For our policies pi i, we give them full state. And so it makes it easier to learn. You learn with full state information. But whatever actions they take in a certain state, the policy pi theta has to agree based on just getting the pixels as input. Okay? The neural net we used here is inspired by the computer vision typical architectures, but a few slight differences that matter a bit. First, in the convolutional layers, there's no pooling because we want to retain the information about where things are. 
Second thing, red box there, that's a softmax layer. What that is doing, it's outputting coordinates of where the features are active. Okay? And those coordinates are then fed into fully connected layers that do motor control or learn motor control. Um, some tasks we looked at, can you insert a block in a tightly fitting opening? Can you hang a coat hanger? Can you place the claw of a hammer underneath a nail? And can you screw a cap onto a bottle, which dexterity-wise is actually very difficult. So the approach we used, called guided policy search, here is the learning in action. What are the policies pi i that have access to full state for every location the cube, the big cube is at? There is a specific policy pi i being trained. In parallel, there's a policy pi theta being trained that needs to agree with those that just uses pixels as inputs. And you see that over time, um, it's able to learn to insert the block in the matching opening. The policies pi i here are learned with some, something called iterative LQG, which is an effective way to learn for specific tasks. And it's, learn, it's using Gaussian mixture models and local linear models to fit models to, to the data it encounters during execution. Um, and then the policy pi theta is a big 92,000 parameter neural net. Here are some uh, results on the other tasks. So this is what the robot is seeing. Um, it's placing the code hanger on the bar. You can put other objects on the bar. It doesn't get distracted by them. Um, here is placement of the block. We saw the training for that. Here is different configuration. Look at how it's holding the hammer. It's actually holding the hammer in different ways. So when it's learning that policy pi theta, it realizes it needs to pay attention to both where the nail is and how it's holding the hammer to be able to generate the right actions. And then this, dexterity-wise, is probably the hardest one of these tasks. Now let's take a look at the third family of methods where you learn a value function. The idea there is that there's this relationship that says the optimal expected sum of rewards, V star from a state S, is equal to the reward you get instantaneously plus then the expected sum of rewards you'll get from the next state onwards under the optimal action. And so you can set up an optimization problem-like thing where you say, I want this set of equations to be satisfied for all states. And that's a more indirect way of trying to find a policy. So people at DeepMind did this very successfully. And when a lot of us saw this at NIPS two years ago, it was a big surprise being able to learn all the way from pixels to joystick actions with Q-learning, which essentially tries to get those equations satisfied. And the performance is very good. Very impressive, and above the horizontal bar here means human level or above. This is taken from their nature paper this year. Now, one thing to also think about is how quickly does it learn? It's one thing to look at final performance. Another thing, how quickly do you get to that performance? That's the exploration problem. Can you explore the world quickly to learn quickly? And so one idea we started looking at um, is to bring some of the all the reinforcement learning ideas about exploration bonuses into making them applicable in these high dimensional spaces where you learn something high dimensional, like maybe a 100,000 or more than that parameter neural net. So we looked at exploration bonuses. And the way we set this up was we said, um, we learn first an autoencoder for the images we see in Atari. Then we'll use one of the inner encoding layers as our pseudo state, so to say. And we'll, from experience, learn to predict what the next state is going to be. Um, then, while we play, we give a bonus based on how inaccurate that prediction is. So if you visit a state where your prediction is very inaccurate, that's probably one you should visit more often to learn more, you get a high bonus. So that's what we run. We compare this with the standard DQN approach, which uses epsilon greedy exploration, which means every now and then, well, 90% down to 5%, you act at random. Um, and we compare this with Boltzmann exploration, which looks at the current Q values and makes higher Q values more likely, but not absolutely chosen. And Thompson sampling, which is a kind of Bayesian approach to do uh, exploration. And so in the plots that you see here, um, I think the, finding, the main finding is that being explicit about exploration helps, whether it's through Thompson sampling, through Boltzmann exploration, or through our approach. Um, each of them tends to outperform the standard epsilon greedy approach. Um, using the model, and the bonuses based on that often helps, but doesn't necessarily always outperform Boltzmann or uh, Thompson. One thing we start thinking about then is, well, can we do more? We want to learn more than just the Q function. Let's also learn a dynamics model in parallel. Let's share. Let's have like a big neural net that has everything in it. Seems a reasonable thing to do. Um, that way, maybe you could learn more quickly. Because if you learn about representation, maybe you can learn more quickly how to act. We actually tried very hard. Couldn't get this to work. Talked informally to some other people. Couldn't get this to work either. 
Um, so we started thinking about, well, what is it? The hope had been this, accelerate, accelerate DQN. Didn't really work. So maybe we're not learning a good representation. Maybe yet something else. So the investigation we did then, which I thought was kind of interesting, was, well, what happens if we pre-train by running DQN till convergence, take the entire neural net train that way, cut off the last layer and just retrain the last layer, or retrain just the last two layers, or fine tune from there, so to say. So in some sense, that's like the ideal stuff you could have put in the early layers is sitting there from the start. Does that at least allow you to learn more quickly? And here are the learning curves for the four variants I described and then traditional DQN. And you can see it's actually very hard to distinguish their performance, suggesting that even initializing the initial layers perfectly, so to say, doesn't speed up learning, so maybe representation learning is not the bottleneck in these learning to play these games, but it's actually something else. Okay, so what are some of the frontiers we're looking at right now? One of them is shared and transfer learning. How do you learn multiple tasks with a big neural net in some shared way across robots or across tasks? Exploration, I think, is still a very big problem to resolve much better than it is resolved right now. Memory is something that in none of the things I described is being used, but naturally in any kind of robotic setting, you want to remember things you've seen in the past. You also want action hierarchies, which means internal goal setting, which means memory. It's not in there right now. And then we've been looking at a lot of tools for experimentation, such as the stochastic computation graphs that John Schulman presented here, and the computation graph toolkit, which is a automatic differentiation library inspired by Theano, but different in a few ways. Um, all right, just want to thank my collaborators. That's it, thank you. Question, yes. Hi, uh, hello. Uh, so I have a question because you show three different examples of things that you did, and in one of them you reduced your supervised learning task. What is a control task? And Generally, the standard way of doing that is with reinforcement learn. So my question is, can you discuss a little bit what would be the benefit of reducing your supervised task because you have no ID, IID samples and so on, so what can you get and what, why didn't you do the same for the other tasks as well? Okay, so the, this is the kind of summary you're, you're referring to, right? And the middle one is where we reduce it to a supervised learning task, something that's been done by Sergey Levin in his PhD work, Igor Mordach in his work, Drew Bagnall with Stefan Ross and so forth. Uh, they call it Dagger. Sergey's work's called Guided Policy Search. So the idea here is that um, sometimes there are versions of the problem that are easier to solve. And easier could mean many things. Um, but in our case, what that meant is if the world is fairly repeatable, that is, even though it's very hard to simulate the world, very hard to predict, if you were to go through the same sequence of actions, it's likely that something very similar were to happen. Then by focusing on a very specific setting repeatedly, something called iterative learning control, which is a very special type of reinforcement learning, it's only applicable there, you can actually learn relatively quickly to succeed at, at a specific task. And so that was the idea there. If we're in a setting where if we focus on a specific task and repeat over and over, we can perfectly reset, so to say. Then we can leverage that to then first succeed at those and use the successes in those as supervision to train a policy that generalizes. Um, there are also other situations. For example, in Stefan Ross and Drew Bagnall's work called uh, Dagger, um, or that was then used by Xia Xia Guo, um, Hong Lak Li, and, and Satinder Singh for their Atari game work, they use Monte Carlo uh, tree search. And so the idea, idea there was um, we're willing to spend a lot of computational cycles initially to search through this game tree to find good execution paths. And then we use those, that's far from real time, but we use those as supervision to train a policy that can run in real time. So that's another reason why you might want to do that. But there are some assumptions here. And so it's not necessarily always applicable to, uh, to be able to apply this. OK, thank you. Any other question? So I have a question. So in practice, how far in the future, uh, how much can you delay the reward? And, and when do things break? And how do you, yeah. Um. <laughs> yes, so that, that's a really good question. That's really at the foundation of a lot of reinforcement learning is analyzing, in some sense, how much delay you can deal with and how noisy things get. So this equation kind of highlights that here. 
So you look at a standard policy gradient calculation. It's a sum of rewards and minus the average that you would get. And essentially, a lot of the tricks played relate, relate to how do you deal with that if the reward is very far delayed. If it's extremely far delayed, probably it'll be a very hard reinforcement learning problem. You might not learn for a very long time. If the reward is not super far delayed, then the thing to think about is, well, maybe I should upweigh the early rewards, not because they're more important, but because they're less noisy. Because these policies are all stochastic policies, and if you equally weigh later rewards compared to earlier rewards, the later ones are in some sense a noisy measurement of what you would get later, but the early ones are very related to what you did early on. And so that's one of the things that this particular paper actually looks at in a lot of detail, is how, how to deal with that noise effect that you get there. Thank you. All right, let's thank Peter again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.